We come now to our 16th lecture in the rational biblical theology of Jonathan Edwards and to what was the very heart of his ministry, evangelism and seeking or preparationism. Surely there never was a finer theologian who spent his whole career as an evangelist than Jonathan Edwards. He was so evangelistic that some otherwise competent historians were persuaded that this great Calvinist had to be an Arminian, though non-evangelistic was never anti Arminian as this particular theologian in his evangelism. As noted before, in his own opinion, the greatest evangelistic success he ever had was with the sermon, The Justice of God in the Damnation of Sinners, which justified also reprobation. He was a predestinarian evangelist if there ever was one. God, he said, doth exercise his sovereignty in the affair of men's eternal salvation. That's the conclusion he draws from Paul's instances cited in verses 8 to 12 of the ninth chapter of Romans, of divine preferences even among the descendants of Abraham. After stating this doctrine, the preacher first asks what sovereignty is, and that is God's absolute independent right of disposing of his creatures to his purpose. As we had noted when we discussed the doctrine of sovereignty, we now see it in relation to human evangelism. And this sovereignty is without proper obligation because God has independent right to his creatures. The implication of such a right is that God may bestow or withhold salvation without prejudice to any of his attributes. If he is bound by anything, such as keeping his promises, this is only because he has sovereignly chosen to make such promises. Edwards then shows that it may be consistent with the justice, mercy, majesty, and truth of God to save or to damn. In this discussion, he has in view the sacrifice of Christ, which satisfies divine justice and repairs the divine majesty. He remarks, since Christ has wrought out the work of redemption, and fulfill the law by obeying, there is none of mankind whom he may not save without any prejudice to any of his attributes. Without this grace, God's justice and other attributes absolutely require damnation. What is God's right to do is also his pleasure to do, Edwards continues. He not only may save some, being determined solely by his good pleasure, but he actually does so. He does so by giving the means of salvation to some nations and individuals while withholding them from others. I can't help but make a side comment on that, that Edwards lived, and he was indeed an instigator of the beginning of worldwide missions especially through the influence of David Brainerd, who was profoundly influenced by Jonathan Edwards. And now, two and a half centuries later, we find most of the world still without a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in spite of the spectacular expansion of Christian missions since the days of Jonathan Edwards. Where, jo where God does give the means of grace, he continues to exercise his sovereignty by making them effectual or not. You see, this is where the Arminians get off the train that Edwards protests so much. In some instances, he saves where there are few means of grace, and on the other hand, 
permits to perish in the midst of spiritual abundance. There are two basic reasons for God's exercise of sovereignty in the salvation of men. The fundamental reason is God's purpose to reveal all his attributes in the creation. He can reveal no one attribute perfectly in intensity, but he does make an extensive revelation of his total being and one ingredient of his being is sovereignty, absolute and independent. The second reason given is only a modification of the first. The greater the creature over which the sovereignty is exercised, the clearer the revelation of this sovereignty. Hence God exercise it over the souls of men and angels as well as over the lower creation. Since Edwards found this doctrine a peculiarly successful means of conversion, again I stress that because most people would say if you believe in predestination, why do you preach? Edwards not only preached, but he found predestination a fundamental incentive to so doing. We are interested to see how he makes application of it to his hearers. First, they are to learn how utterly dependent they are on God. Utterly dependent. They cannot even initiate their salvation, Edwards stresses. Second, they are to adore the awful and absolute divine authority. Third, they are therefore to exalt God in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for his sovereignty is the aspect of his grace most honored in Scripture. And let us marvel at the condescension of the sovereign God who has chosen to bind himself in covenant. Remember, we discussed a little, but entirely too briefly, the covenantal thinking of Jonathan Edwards. And one of his stresses was that there was that infinite stoop when God chose to deal with man, and even deeper when he bound himself to certain persons by covenant. Avoid presumption on the one hand, he advises his hearers, for God is sovereign, not you, or discouragement on the other, for God is gracious. The greatest sinner among you may be saved, if God pleases, is the evangelistic conclusion of the matter according to Edwards. Men will be saved, he says, when they recognize that God alone can save them. I, it's a sort of sad, grim laughter on my part, because I know in this last decade of the 20th century, most people think they're saved because their salvation is not in the hands of anyone except themselves. And Edwards is saying, you can't be saved until you realize your salvation is absolutely dependent upon the sovereign authority of God. Men will be saved, he says, when they recognize that God alone can save them, and only if he, not they, but he, pleases. The sermon ends on a note of encouragement. Let you be what sinner you may, God can greatly glorify himself in your salvation. There's Edward, you see. Glorify himself in your salvation. He preached hell fire, not to scare people out of their wits, but into them. No one could be driven by fear into heaven in the mind of Jonathan Edwards, but into seeking heaven. Fear can't drive you to heaven, but fear can drive you to thinking about heaven and the way there too. Those who oppose such preaching were, he warned fellow ministers, less zealous than he 
in danger of the unpardonable sin of actually fighting against the Holy Spirit and attributing to the mass hysteria or melancholy or mental imbalance what was actually, of men, what was actually the working of the Spirit of God. If there are any that will still resolutely go on to speak contemptibly of these things, as there were many, especially around Boston, I would beg of them to take heed that they beant guilty of the unpardonable sin against the Holy Ghost. A time when the Holy Spirit is much poured out and men's lusts, lukewarmness, and hypocrisy reproached by its powerful operations is the most likely time of any whatsoever for this sin against the Holy Ghost to be committed. If the work goes on, tis well if among the many that show an enmity against it and reproach it, some being guilty of this sin, if, not, if none has already been. Those that maliciously oppose and reproach this work and call it the work of the devil want but one thing of the unpardonable sin, and that is doing it against inward convictions. I call your attention to the fact that Edwards, to my knowledge, never accused any particular individual of having committed the unpardonable sin. But he did warn many of them of their peril of it. And wherein they haven't committed it, when they are in open opposition to the work of the Holy Spirit, he uh, suggests is because they aren't really working against inner conviction. That is, they don't see clearly that this is a work of the Holy Spirit, because if they did see clearly and still opposed it, then, of course, they would be indubitably guilty of the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit. Edwards entertains the hope that in spite of their virulent opposition, and they were virulent, and as he says here, attributing to the devil what was the work of the Holy Spirit, the only hope was they did it, as it were, in ignorance, not really understanding that this was the work of God's Spirit. And though some are so prudent as not openly to oppose and reproach the work, yet tis to be feared at this day when the Lord is going forth so gloriously against his enemies that many that are silent and unactive, especially ministers, will bring that curse of the angel of the Lord upon themselves. Judges 5, 23, curse ye Marah, said the angel of the Lord, curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. There again was a deep ring of something from which Edwards himself suffered when he was later dismissed from his Northampton congregation, partly because some who knew the allegations were false altogether didn't come forth against the mighty to defend this servant of the Lord. They didn't oppose him but neither did they expose themselves. And now he's talking about the broader canvas of some of them who don't actually attribute the work of God to the devil, who nevertheless don't champion it either. And he suggests that they are liable to this curse of Meraz, which he cites. Edwards did not hesitate to appeal to the sinner's self-interest in his separate efforts to save himself. The great problem is how to appeal to sinners to seek with all their heart a gospel that they hate with all their heart. Remember when we discussed the doctrine of total depravity in Edwards, he made it very clear that men would kill God if they could. They hated him with all the intensity of their being. How are you going to woo people like that? 
in any meaningful sense to seek a God they would like to kill. As he says, a great problem is how to appeal to sinners to seek with all their heart a gospel they hate with all their heart. How is the evangelist to persuade his hearers to seek what they are inclined to flee? Here again, I point out the difference between Edwardsian evangelism and the Arminianism he was opposing. The Arminians would say, you see, you can woo people. You can show them the wonders of heaven. There's a remnant of goodness in them or a restoring of some of the goodness through the benefits of the atonement so that men can be appealed to and they can actually be attracted by the gospel. Now, that sort of thing was utterly out of the realm of possibility in the thinking of a genuine Calvinist such as Edwards was. So the question is, how do you get people to come to someone whom they actually hate? To what good motive can the preacher appeal in men who are not inclined to good motives? Or if they have no good motives, to what can the evangelist appeal? There seems to be nothing left but an evil motive, an evil motive for seeking a good thing. It is at this point that Edwards makes an evangelistic appeal to an unworthy motive. I alluded to that, you know, before, this matter of self-love. That is not evil to begin with. It was a part of man's basic makeup when he was made upright in the image of God. But when it operates in independence of the love of God toward which it should be directed because that's the only way to love yourself by loving him. When it is divorced from that and separated from that and becomes autonomous and self-centered on the sinner, then of course it is evil. But nevertheless, it is residual in him and consequently, the evangelist Jonathan Edwards is going to appear, appeal to this which created by God was good, but disturbed, distorted by man was evil. And so to a sort of crass self-interest, Jonathan Edwards is going to try to get persons, as it were, to the altar. Though you should go to heaven, yet if you will live a moral life, you will surely have a less punishment. It's one of the, the three Ps I should get mentioned over uh, to you in this matter of preparationism and seeking the gospel. And one of them is this one here, less punishment or prevention of more punishment in hell. If you do read the Bible, rather than pornography. It's still sinful when you're motivated evilly this way. But it is not as sinful as reading pornography. Consequently, you will prevent some of the judgment coming upon you by reading the Bible, even though it's not with the love of God in your heart and not a good work. In and of itself, it's a good thing, and it is certainly not as obnoxious in God's eyes as being alienated from him in heart and at the same time violating his commandments in your behavior by reading foul literature. The other one is prosperity. And if you actually do seek God, you will be in strictest conformity to the commandments of God. So if you're a shoemaker, you're going to make the best shoes in Massachusetts, and people are going to beat their way to your door. If you're an optician, you're going to make the best glasses. If you're a wife, you're going to be the best housewife. Whatever you are, you are going to prosper as a seeker of God because in the mere seeking, you're going to do the best possible job in your trade. And thirdly, the possibility. This is the greatest of all. It is only a possibility, but it is a great possibility and even a probable prob possibility that you will, by God's grace, be given the salvation you insincerely seek.
During his days in Northampton, Edwards saw some times of God's special willingness to convert and save. Their pastor urged his perishing people, not all of them were perishing, you understand, but some of them were and some of them knew it and were seeking God, hoping to be delivered from their broad road to destruction. And he would appeal to them, and then there were others, he believed, who were perishing, who thought they were on their way to glory. But many of them gave evidence of being truly converted people. But their pastor urged his perishing people to take full advantage of such rare times, full of hope, yet fraught with great danger, if neglected. God hath his certain days or appointed seasons of the exercising both of mercy and judgment, he preached. There are some remarkable times of wrath laid out by God for his awful visitation and the execution of his anger, which times are called days of vengeance, wherein God will visit sin. And so, on the contrary, God has laid out in his sovereign counsel seasons of remarkable mercy, wherein he will manifest himself in the exercises of his grace and loving kindness more than at other times. Such times in scriptures are called, by way of eminency, accepted times and the days of salvation and also days of God's visitation because they are days wherein God will visit in a way of mercy. It is such a time now in this time, and I can't help but express my hope to you hearers of these tapes that this may be a time of God's nearness to you that you will not neglect, but will take the occasion of actually finding what you now seek. It is such a time now in this town of Northampton. It is indeed a day of grace with us as long as we live in this world in the enjoyment of the means of grace. But such a time as this is especially so, and in a distinguishing manner, a day of grace. When conversion and salvation work is going on amongst us from Sabbath to Sabbath, as we mentioned later on, this is the sort of thing that made Edwards think that the millennium may have been approaching in those days. When people miss such opportunities, hardening of heart almost inevitably followed as God's spirit was withdrawing. From this we may be able to construct a definition of hardening. Hardening is that process of reaction to the Holy Spirit's gospel overtures by which a naturally sinful and hostile person becomes more sinful and more hostile. Some of this process goes on in men who are not subject to the light of the Christian revelation, but the term in Edwards' evangelism seems to be applied more specifically to gospel sinners. I cannot resist comparing here a typical covenantal outlook to Edwards' view. As I say, he was a covenant theologian, and he had his view of the covenant, which I very inadequately mentioned earlier. But at the same time, it's quite different from what goes by the name covenantal in his day, but especially so in our day. And I'll take a moment to contrast that in this very context where it's most applicable, namely evangelism. It is obvious that covenantal people would feel no such anxiety about the congregation as a Puritan pastor. They would see Edwards as relying on revival when he should have confidence in the covenant of grace. His people had been recognized as a covenant people at their infant baptism, and the covenantal pastor would see no occasion for alarm in the circumstances, Edward cites. Concern, yes, but no alarm, not to mention fear, and nothing approaching despair. 
It is this covenantal mood in Northampton, which a few years later will lead to the expulsion of Northampton's pastor. To give you a, a vivid contemporary illustration, I know one very capable reformed pastor who says it's a positive sin to evangelize your baptized children. They are elect because they were born of Christian parents and they are regenerate because they were conceived in a Christian womb and you ought to recognize that from their infant baptism on and to act as if they were actually lost who needed to be redeemed is in that reformed pastor and many others an actual violation of the divinely revealed covenant of God. Edwards, as I say, was a covenant theologian, but he never saw the covenant as meaning that everybody who was connected with it or under the obligations of it was therefore an elect person or a regenerate person. And his evangelism did very seriously concern the winning of the children, the baptized infants of God's people in Northampton and wherever. The pastor warned especially those who were spiritually asleep, I may say. And here to speak plainly, I must need say concerning some persons in this congregation, and especially those that are past their youth and are not yet much awakened that unless there should be amongst us a much more remarkable and wonderful day of mercy than this town has ever known. It is not probable that they will, and I will say it's not likely. Otherwise, there's very little likelihood that you will be saved. You who are asleep, you who've grown up, and are now, as it were, in age and are still asleep, it's very, very unlikely that if you could have slept through these recent days of remarkable outpouring of the Spirit of God that you will ever be saved. Some may be ready to wonder that I should speak so plain, he said. There has been almost everything to make your case look dangerous. Some will go to hell, and who will they be so likely? If we don't look upon you likely to be damned, who is likely? Some of you are so little to waken now at such a day as this he laments. Though it was Edwards's difference with Solomon Stoddard that led to his dismissal from the Northampton pulpit, he did not depart from his predecessor's evangelism or lag in his zeal for the great work Stoddard had done for the salvation of his and now Edwards's people. And he cites in one of his sermons how could you could have held out against the strong warnings and invitations of Solomon Stoddard was beyond Edwards to understand. Important as doctrine was to faith, life and salvation could be made an excuse for unbelief or lack of awakening, and he laments that sad detail. But seeking or preparation for salvation, I conclude, was the evangelistic message of Puritanism, and Jonathan Edwards certainly preached it and practiced it with one extraordinary thoroughness and, judging from the responses, great divinely given spiritual success.